they're going to put it aside and they're not going to act on it. And we have an information war going on. If you want to have uh, things move in international law, you have to have a movement. You have to have uh, people riled up uh, at what is happening. And that's what, of course, we see today in the uh, university campuses that the students who see it on television, that genocide is actually happening before their eyes, they are protesting. But uh, the United Nations and the International Court of Justice should help them with provisional measures, should speak clear language and say, this is genocide and nothing less. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I got with me an extraordinary scholar, thinker and activist with many years of experience in the UN system, especially in the field of human rights. I'm talking to Dr. Dr. Alfred Desayas, a professor at the Geneva School of Diplomacy who used to work as a senior lawyer in the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and later became the first UN independent expert on international order, serving in that capacity from 2012 to 2018. Born in Cuba, Dr. Desayas holds a doctorate in jurisprudence from Harvard Law School and a PhD in modern history from the German University of Göttingen. Dr. Desayas is also a member of the Geneva International Peace Research Institute, where he and his team are currently working on a legal case against Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel and Joseph Borrell. It is an extraordinary privilege of talking to you, Professor Desayas, so thank you very much for coming online. Thank you, Pascal, for inviting me. And as I say, I think we are uh, both uh, Swiss citizens and very proud to be a Swiss citizen since uh, 2017. Uh, my wife, uh, originally Dutch, uh, she's also a Swiss citizen and she's actually a conseillère municipale here yeah. in Italy. So we're actually quite well integrated in Switzerland and we believe in direct democracy, which is what seems to be lost in the world and at least we haven't missed a single referendum in the seven years that we have been citizens. And I wish we had referenda in the United States. I wish we had referenda uh, in uh, Germany and in France and in the uh, United Kingdom, because ask the people, do you want peace or war? You know that the people want peace. It's the we governments and the elites. But yeah. we, we, we know that the elites are scared of that. And, you know, in Switzerland, it, it, we, we can prove time and again that people vote differently from what n the national government would actually want. And we keep doing that. I just w I'm involved into this, in this referendum for more neutrality. And we have good hopes of actually turning things around. So we, and the government listens to that. I wonder, other countries don't want to do that, which w is why I keep saying the United States, Germany, they don't have very good democracies. They have they like... not democracies, period, or oligarchies. And there's the revolving door. I mean, you are member of government. When you are voted out, you go into a think tank and you get a huge salary like uh, 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 Victoria Nuland. And then you come back into government and uh, you're not accountable uh, to your electorate. You're not accountable uh, to the people. You're accountable to those who finance your campaign and the campaigns in the United States go into the millions and millions and millions of dollars, so that uh, unless you have a sponsor in the military industrial financial complex, uh, you don't get elected. So, I mean, there's no one, there's very, very few uh, congressmen and congresswomen who are independent. I mean, they are, as I say, responsible to the Raytheon, Lockheed uh, Martin, Boeing, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, which has enormous lobbies. I mean, the lobbies have completely destroyed uh, democracy. I mean, uh, the United States is a disgrace. There is a breakdown in the rule of law in the United States, domestically and internationally, because we don't respect international law at all. And uh, our foreign minister, you know, I'm also an American citizen. Our foreign minister, Anthony Blinken, uh, dares talk about a rules-based international order. But we do have it. It's the United Nations Charter. The problem is that the United States does not want to respect the U UN Charter, does not act 
according to the letter and the spirit uh, of the Charter. But you have questions. No, let, let's go there and let's start with this one first, actually, with human rights, international law and, and what's currently going on. I talked on this program to John Dugar uh, about a year ago, uh, who used to be the special rapporteur on human rights in Palestine and who, who is an international law expert. And he wrote the first kind of uh, comprehensive piece on why the, hum the international... Um, the, the, the rights-based international order is is not at all an international law concept. I think you would subscribe to that very much. Why no, is it that at the moment the West the West is tearing down the international law institutions it has been building up for more than hundred years? Why? Well, we have been tearing down uh, the most fundamental general principles of law. We have given up on good faith on keeping your word uh, obviously what uh, bill clinton did to uh, the russians when he ignored uh, the binding oral agreements between uh, president george hw bush and gorbachev and our secretary of state uh, james baker i mean in international law, uh, for it to function, uh, you cannot just simply apply it a la carte. You apply it today this way, tomorrow that way. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, give your word as a um, uh, uh, head of state or as a foreign minister uh, and then ignore it tomorrow because then Everything is built on trust. When there's no more trust, uh, then you don't have an order. Uh, you have the jungle. And uh, that's the direction that we are going. And uh, um, we seem to uh, uh, have a narrative. Uh, we give lip service uh, to human rights, etc., but we violate them uh, consistently. And the problem is that uh, we're giving a very bad example uh, to new democracies or new states in Latin America and Africa and Asia. So they're not blind, they're not stupid. If they see that the United States uh, breaks international law uh, with impunity, they figure if they do it, we can do it too. And uh, the old, shall we say, admiration that existed uh, for the United States uh, as a beacon uh, of international law and of human rights, uh, that has lost its luster. Yeah. But uh, nobody believes that narrative anymore in Latin America or in Africa or in Asia. But Washington is not quite aware of it yet. I mean, we keep living in this um, delusion that uh, people still think that we are the leaders and we have lost that leadership for our own fault. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, the history of human rights and human rights law is the history of breaking those laws, right? And, and, and the constant struggle to trying to, to create some form of, of uh, institutions or mechanisms that help ameliorate the horrible situation, right? And one of the things, one of the step forward really was the, the, uh, the creation of the ICC back in 2002, the Rome Statute, you know, when there was a lot of hope that now you can push this thing forward. And in the last 10 days, we have seen this amazing unprecedented uh, moment when uh, when there was suddenly the ICC in, 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 in the spotlight and Netanyahu made a little Twitter video saying like, oh, they want to they want, they, they want um, issue arrest warrants and 12 senators in the US write a threatening letter that we will retaliate if you do that. And I mean, the ICC has been politicized before and maybe you can explain to us why the ICC is so politicized as opposed to the ICJ, which is a little bit more uh, independent. Maybe you could talk about that. But this is unprecedented this attack on, on an international court that just a year ago, uh, one and a half years ago, was so praised for actually uh, issuing arrest warrants against Vladimir Putin, right? So this is such a, this is such a, a cognitive dissonance that hurts so badly. Can you talk about that? 
it, it is shameless, but of course we are shameless in the United States. I mean, it's uh, there are a handful of great professors of international law and professors of international relations, you know, like uh, Richard Falk and uh, Jeffrey Sachs and John Mersheimer, et cetera. Uh, but they're, most of them uh, are careerists and most of them are accommodated to power. And they know that if they want, uh, if they aspire to anything higher, uh, they have to play the game. So that has corrupted uh, the system. Back 40 years ago, I was writing uh, articles about the possibility of an international criminal court. And I was professor in Chicago and uh, together with Professor uh, Sharif Basuni at the uh, DePaul University. And we wrote a, a book together uh, on human rights in the uh, administration of criminal justice. And we were pushing for a um, an international criminal court. Uh, Basuni was basically the drafter uh, of the uh, first statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and um, uh, he believed very much in the ICC. He passed away about five years ago. I think it would be deeply, deeply hurt and deeply disappointed uh, seeing what came off of it. Uh, I mean, it's not just now uh, that uh, the United States senators and others are threatening the ICC. Back uh, uh, seven years ago, uh, Trump uh, threatened uh, the then uh, prosecutor, uh, Fatou Ben Souda, uh, and uh, actually imposed sanctions on her and her team because uh, she dared to investigate into NATO crimes and crimes against humanity uh, in Afghanistan. And the first thing that the uh, successor of Fatou Ben Souda did, Karim Khan, is to discontinue the investigation into uh, uh, American and NATO crimes in Afghanistan, but continue the um, uh, investigations about Taliban uh, war crimes. Now, uh, the precedent has been set uh, by the International Criminal uh, Court that a sitting head of state, uh, the first one was uh, al-Bashir of uh, uh, Sudan, uh, can actually be indicted. That actually follows Article 27 uh, of the statute of the International Criminal Court, the Statute of Rome. And uh, so there's no more immunity uh, since in the past, according to judgments of the International Court of Justice, take the judgment in um, Congo against Belgium, judgment of 2002, quite clearly, you know, a sitting head of state uh, has total immunity. You cannot indict him. That changed with the statute of Rome. And uh, so al-Bashir of Sudan, then Putin. So now if the court fails to issue an indictment against President Herzog or against uh, Netanyahu or against uh, Avigdor Lieberman and all the others who have actually expressed genocidal intent with regard uh, to the uh, Gaza uh, population, uh, then the court has lost whatever little credibility it already had. I see the possibility of an, a stampede of countries leaving the statute of Rome. I mean, this almost happened uh, back uh, in 2015 when uh, al-Bashir uh, went to uh, a meeting uh, of the African Union in South Africa, and South Africa did not arrest him and did not deliver him to the ICC. So the ICC got, you know, very angry and they started a case against the South, South Africans. And in the end, they more or less discreetly left it because several states in Africa had already said, okay, if that's the way you're playing the game, goodbye. And uh, if the court now fails to issue a uh, an arrest warrant in a case as clear as this one, I mean, this is far clearer and far worse 
than what was accused, uh, what Putin was accused of. Uh, so that uh, uh, the court uh, would, of course, the United States would protest and they would impose sanctions. They impose uh, unilateral course of measures on everybody. You know, one third of the population of the world is suffering unilateral course of measures uh, from the U.S. So, I mean, it's, it would not be surprising. But the United States is in open rebellion against uh international law. That is what we are witnessing. Can you help me for a moment? The, the, if we compare the ICC to the ICJ, in the ICJ the process is that a member country needs to drag another country in front of the court and then you have a 15 slash 17 judge panel that will weigh everything and the evidence and da 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 da. And in the ICC how does it work? Why is the prosecutor general so powerful in deciding what the court does and what not? Can members not initiate things against each other? Well, members certainly can. And members have. I mean, certainly it's not just motu proprio that Karim Khan uh, starts a case. I mean, he's been pushed by uh, Algeria and by Djibouti, etc., to uh, indict uh, Netanyahu. What I would like to see is an avalanche of countries, states, parties to the uh, Statute of Rome to uh, demand of the court to indict all of these people and uh, to act quickly, because one of the, shall we say, practices, uh, both of the ICC and of the ICJ is to drag their feet when they're scared uh, of the political consequences uh, of a particular case, they will not decide on it. And uh, they have too much discretion, actually. And uh, they are playing the game. Now, the uh, ICC, as I said, is very much corrupted. I explained that in a chapter of my book, uh, the, uh, the Human Rights Industry. It's something that worries me a great deal because I do believe in international law. I do believe in the necessity of international law, the necessity of the United Nations. If we didn't have a United Nations, we would have to found one. If we didn't have a Human Rights Council, we would have to establish one. Uh, it's better to have rules, even if the rules are broken, than to have no rules at all. Uh, on the other hand, it is possible to reform the system. It is possible to um, impose, shall we say, uh, a commitment of all states to play by the rules and to have consequences if you don't. Uh, but the International Court of Justice uh, is not above criticism. Uh, I know several of the judges personally. I have been actually on very friendly terms uh, with many judges over the years. Uh, and uh, without a doubt, uh, it is not just a judicial organ, it is a political organ. Uh, it is inconceivable that uh, the United States would nominate an independent judge to the court. They're going to nominate, and they have always nominated uh, uh, judges who will toe the line. But in her last ruling on, on Israel, the American judge actually was fairly and squarely on the side of those who said provisional measures on Israel. Well, but they did not issue a provisional measure ordering a ceasefire. Yeah. That was, uh, of course, it was a compromise. I mean, in uh, a collegial body, there's always, um, shall we say, horse trading. And uh, they don't go as far as they could in cases that demand it, and this case demanded it. Uh, I was pleased uh, with the first set of six uh, provisional measures and with a second set of provisional measures, because there were two, one of 26 of January, one of 15. Uh, of March, which Israel has completely ignored and violated with impunity because the United States continues issuing the veto, the veto uh, in the Security Council to shield uh, Israel uh, from uh, criticism. But the essential problem with the International Court of Justice, I mean, I personally know the Japanese member, I personally know the German member, uh, I have known in the past uh, the members uh, from uh, um, Jordan and uh, from um, 
um, uh, India and from China, uh, as a case may be. The current uh, composition is very pro-Western, is very heavily uh, pro-Western. You have an Australian member, you have an American member, you have a French member, you have a German member, you have uh, a Romanian member, members of NATO, members of the European Union that are in there, uh, but you don't have a, a judge from Russia or from uh, Belarus. You don't have a judge uh, from Cuba or Honduras or Nicaragua or Colombia. The, the fact is that you need more representation from um, Africa, more representation uh, from Asia. And even if you have an African or an Asian or a Latin American, if that person was educated uh, in the United States or in the United Kingdom, uh, that person has a mindset uh, that is akin, that is related uh, to uh, the Western approach to law. And I think you have to have all of the schools of legal thinking represented in an international court of justice. Uh, as I said, right now it is heavily pro-Western and uh, it is surprising when they do adopt a decision um, uh, as they did in the case of South Africa against Israel. But I'm highly disappointed uh, with uh, the denial of uh, provisional measures demanded by Nicaragua in the Nicaragua against Germany case. I mean, it's quite clear that Germany is complicit uh, in the genocide. Uh, complicit by giving not only aid and comfort uh, to um, uh, to Israel politically and otherwise, but by delivering lethal weapons that have been used in the genocide. Now, uh, the uh, the court uh, affirmed its jurisdiction. The court kept the case on the list. Germany went all out to say uh, the case must be struck from the list, you have no jurisdiction, the case is inadmissible. That has not been uh, accepted by the court. The court kept the case. But I expect that Nicaragua uh, uh, against uh, Germany, we will put on the back burner and they probably won't touch it. You know, once they did not issue the provisional measures, now uh, it's going to be Fernaliefen, as the Germans say, they're going to put it aside and they're not going to act on it. And we have an information war going on. If you want to have uh, things move in international law, you have to have a movement. You have to have uh, people riled up uh, at what is happening. And that's what, of course, we see today in the uh, university campuses that the students who see it on television, that genocide is actually happening before their eyes, they are protesting. But uh, the United Nations and the International Court of Justice should help them with provisional measures, should please have, speak clear language and say, this is genocide and nothing less. I keep saying to my students that at the end of the day, although I completely agree with you, international law matters. It matters what states want and don't want to do, and they do want to perceive in a certain way, and therefore norms have a role to play. Um, but it, politics will trump law because it's politics that makes the law. So hence, it, it's 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 primary. Now, what you're just talking about is also the public perception of what is going on. And we have seen, in my view and in views of others, the most relentless propaganda probably ever since, maybe probably since the 1960s, since the Red Scare, that, that, that we have seen like relentless uh, approaches at trying to shape uh, public narratives in, me in mainstream media, which is one of the reasons why uh, alternative media like this one, like uh, shows on YouTube, become popular because people want alternative and, and actual uh, analysis of, of what is happening. How do you see this interplay between law, politics and uh, media propaganda? Well, uh, the theory is that uh, uh, politics should be in the service of law and not law in the service of politics. That's a theory. Uh, the situation is totally different. 
The situation is that uh, governments set the narrative, and in the past, uh, the media uh, was the watchdog uh, of human rights, was the watchdog uh, of the rights uh, of the electorate. Uh, that has changed um, over the last 40 years. Uh, the um, shall we say the independent uh, newspapers have disappeared, everything has been bought up by conglom conglomerates, and those are responsive to uh, the government. They are echo chambers uh, for the Pentagon and for the uh, State Department. Uh, I used to write uh, regularly in Germany for the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. I used to get, you know, entire pages. Uh, I used to write for um, uh, Die Welt. I did many, many uh, op-eds uh, in Die Welt. They wouldn't touch anything of what I'm writing now because they are completely in the service of, uh, shall we say, this uh, elitist uh, uh, oligarchical uh, system, and um, which is actually far more powerful than anything that... Um, George Orwell thought in his 1984, or for that matter, Aldous Huxley uh, in uh, Brave New World. Um, it's the relentless brainwashing uh, of the population that allows uh, government to get away with it. Of course, in, in the average person has his wife, his children, his concerns. Uh, international politics is not uh, the priority uh, of most people. So uh, they kind of say, okay, they're not too bad, let them do their work, and they don't think. It's students who have more time, who still don't have the responsibilities of having a family, uh, that uh, actually realize that something is going on that is very, very, very wrong. And that's why uh, we are demonstrating. I used to demonstrate back 50 years ago uh, against the Vietnam War. And when I was at Harvard, I demonstrated quite regularly against the Vietnam War. And of course, we were also beaten up. <laughs> the police was thrown against us more than once. And um, what we see now in uh, uh, Harvard and Columbia and Berkeley at uh, UCLA, at Michigan, etc., cetera, uh, gives me hope uh, that people have said enough is enough. We're not going to put up with this. And uh, our governments have to stop their complicity uh, in uh, in genocide, but it is not yet. We're not yet there because governments do not listen to the people. As I said, here in Switzerland, we have referenda. Here in Switzerland, the people are consulted. Not only consulted, they are informed. Because I've never seen in any other country, and I've been monitor of elections, et cetera, et cetera. I was monitor for the... Uh, uh, United Nations in the Ukrainian presidential and parliamentary elections uh, in 1994, crisscrossed the country, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, oh, bless, that was uh, pro forma. Uh, the, um, uh, in Switzerland, you get a booklet uh, with the positions of all the parties, with the position of the uh, Conseil Federal, with uh, you know exactly what is at issue what are the arguments pro and con? And then you can decide. And you go on the internet and you can say, these are my preferences. And uh, the computer will tell you, then you're closest to the PS or you're closest to the Volkspartei or you're closest to uh, the Greens or you're closest uh, to the, uh, the Christian Democrats or whatever. Uh, so that is here, shall we say, a matured system. Uh, of democracy where people are consulted and people are informed. Uh, the rest of the world, uh, elections uh, don't make much of a difference. So you may recall the statement uh, of uh, Kurt uh, Tucholsky, uh, 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 wenn Wahlen etwas ändern würden, dann wären sie abgeschafft. You know, the, if, um, uh, if uh, elections would change anything, they would be abolished. I mean, it's, uh, and the funniest thing is that the propaganda, just by sheer repetition, that we are a democracy, 
that Germany is a democracy, that Israel is a democracy, people tend to believe it. And but except, except when the United States uses this little word democracy, and uh, it has, of course, the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, but what we mean is National Endowment for Capitalism. Democracy is equated uh, with uh, capitalism. So countries that uh, embrace capitalism are democratic. Countries that uh, are a mixed bag or that um, uh, uh, accept only certain tenets of capitalism, but not, not the rest, uh, are authoritarian. Uh, dividing the world uh, in this manner uh, seems to you and seems to me uh, completely infantile, or completely um, primitive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it has been effective in, uh, shall we say, keeping the population down, uh, in more or less uh, tranquilizing them so that they don't realize that they're being manipulated all the time. And uh, I must say, I was a great believer in American democracy, and it took me decades, I'm not saying years, decades, uh, to realize that uh, my, my illusions were not based uh, on fact, they were based uh, on propaganda, they were based uh, on what I have been taught uh, in uh, high school and in college and university and what you know you read in the press and what you saw in Hollywood. Uh, so the real world is totally different from that uh, which we have been taught. But I must say once you break uh, with uh, these illusions, once you realize that Santa Claus doesn't exist, you are actually liberated. You you you. you Initially, you're disappointed, you're sad, uh, you, you are even upset. But after that, uh, then you go forward. Then, then you are a free person. And then you can, as uh, Horatius and uh, Immanuel Kant used to say, sapere aude, uh, you can have the courage of your own convictions. You can use your own brain. You don't depend on groupthink. You don't have to simply echo whatever nonsense you heard last night in CNN, uh, you have access to information. You can fact check uh, the news that you get, and then you can arrive at a synthesis that is far closer to reality than what we're getting. Yeah. And I, you know, the interesting thing to me is that obviously the question of democracy or autocracy is absolutely dumb because it's obviously not a dichotomy. It's obviously a scale, right? And you have certain countries that function uh, according to more democratic principles and such uh, according to less or just masquerade. I would never ever say that uh, the Chinese political system is on the say uh, is functioning in the same way that the German political system does, although to the outside they have like similar sounding institutions and so on, but under the hood everything works differently. And in the US and, and, and the UK too, it works very, very different. And if we do the scale of good democracy, bad democracy, then definitely Switzerland is far higher up than, than the United States or Germany because of this, this representation issue. The interesting thing to me in international politics is that international law actually doesn't give a damn. It doesn't care on whether a country is, a, is, is democratic or autocratic. It all, the only thing it cares about is, it, is it recognized by others? If yes, then so be it. You're part, of the, you're part of the club. And now let's discuss together. So all in all, international law is a very pragmatic way of structuring the inter international relations. And we see that every country wants to be perceived as a good guy. Nobody wants to be perceived as a bad guy. Uh, nobody wants to be perceived as I'm breaking law. They all make up reasons why what they're doing is, is legal. So do you have hope um, in, in international law actually um, helping us to structure our 8 billion self-organizing planet further? Well, if we win the information war, yes, because international law is rational, and it has uh, a logic that, that I adhere to. Uh, what I do not accept is double standards. What I do not accept is international law a la carte. And the United States in its, uh, shall we say, pragmatism, in its uh, 
shall we say, imperial pragmatism uh, does not adhere to international law. The United States perceives itself as the indispensable country, as the exceptional country, and it perceives itself as above uh, international law. And that's why the United States does not uh, submit itself uh, to any uh, adjudication by international tribunals. Uh, the United States uh, had given the famous uh, declaration under Article 36 of the statute of the ICJ. It withdrew it after losing several cases in the ICJ, uh, notably the Nicaragua against the United States case of 1986. Uh, and uh, there were still certain treaties that provided for automatic uh, referral uh, to the um, uh, International Court of Justice, among them uh, the Genocide Convention, Article 9 thereof. But when the U.S. finally ratified the Genocide Convention 44 years after its adoption in 1992, that was under George H.W. Bush, he accepted it, but with a reservation. He put a reservation to Article 9. So you cannot bring a case automatically to the ICJ on the issue of genocide unless the United States agrees. And of course, the United States does not agree. Uh, the, shall we say, the last remnant uh, of uh, acceptance of international adjudication uh, was the optional protocol uh, to the uh, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Uh, there were a number of cases against the United States because, um, especially because of the death penalty, uh, against um, citizens of other countries. Uh, you had the Lagrand case. Uh, the Lagrand brothers uh, were uh, Germans uh, who had the uh, the parents had divorced and the mother took the kids to the States and of course they didn't have a, a proper upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. They engaged in a burglary that went bad. And uh, so uh, when uh, Germany found out that two of their citizens were under death sentence, they, they asked for a um, uh, an order, provisional order, uh, from the International Court of Justice that they should not be executed. Of course, the order was granted and they were executed. United States doesn't care. And then came uh, another case, Avena and 51 Mexicans. Um, and the court again uh, issued a, an order not to execute them. The United States went ahead and executed them. And, um, and then the United States said, no, nah, uh, uh, we are denouncing the optional protocols. So we will never again be brought uh, to the court. Uh, obviously, the United States continues violating the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Uh, so the violation of international law is there, uh, but you cannot uh, bring it to the International Court of Justice for adjudication because the United States has removed uh, the uh, recognition of the ICJ uh, to adjudicate the case. Uh, so uh, the United States similarly does not accept any kind of um, uh, individual complaints procedures, not in, in the Human Rights Committee or in the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights or in the um, uh, uh, Committee Against Torture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why the United States commits just monstrous crimes like the torture in Abu Ghraib and in Guantanamo and the uh, extraordinary renditions uh, under George W. Bush. That was particularly ugly, period. As the case may be, uh, other than uh, criticism in the Human Rights Council, uh, there's nothing because uh, you cannot condemn the United States uh, 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 before no. a, uh, a tribunal. Yeah. No, but but the United States is the largest superpower we've ever had, and these these beasts never let themselves be constrained by by higher rules that are not their own. I, I understand the logic of that, but what we have seen what was that, five, six weeks ago? Israel attacking a 
embassy compound and, and for everybody watching and consulate is part of an embassy compound and is covered by the Vienna Convention and if, you know this is so blatant and then the argumentation that because there was military personnel of, a, of, a, of an enemy state uh, uh, present that makes it a military target is so utterly ridiculous because every single embassy in the world usually has military attaches and that would blow up the entire concept. Now if this continues, I mean, is are we going to lose the Vienna Convention? Are we going to lose these, these norms? Because states are going to say like, well, flip it. I'm not going to do this either. I'm now going to attack uh, any kind of embassy I want because it hurts my enemy. Well, uh, we need the norms. We need to return uh, to, shall we say, an acceptance uh, that these norms are a common denominator for modus vivendi in the world, for uh, uh, living together. Uh, if we don't have norms, uh, then it's really going to be a uh, total war, permanent war throughout the planet. We don't want that. Uh, so we realize that it's being violated crassly by Israel in the case of, of the embassy uh, in um, uh, in uh, uh, Syria, uh, in Damascus, and um, 25 years ago, we just uh, remembered uh, the illegal, totally illegal attack by NATO uh, against uh, uh, Belgrade, against the civilian population uh, of Serbia. Uh, and uh, the attack on the Chinese uh, embassy in Belgrade. And when he was there uh, recently uh, visiting uh, the Serbian government, uh, he specifically made reference uh, to the destruction of the Chinese um, embassy in Belgrade in 1999. Uh, but for my, this one, the U.S. actually apologized and paid rep uh, reparations. True. Very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, now you have a case in the International Court of Justice, uh, the case of Mexico against Ecuador, because uh, Ecuador did something that not even uh, in the horrible years uh, of the military hunters in Chile and in Argentina, uh, you did not have the government uh, sending its troops or sending its police uh, to break into uh, an embassy and to uh, kidnap uh, a person who had diplomatic asylum in that um, uh, embassy. And uh, no doubt Ecuador is going to be solidly uh, convicted uh, for having uh, broken into the Mexican embassy in Quito and having kidnapped uh, the former uh, vice president uh, of uh, uh, Ecuador, um, Jorge Glass, who had sought uh, and obtained diplomatic uh, asylum uh, in, uh, in the embassy. Now, uh, the arguments uh, of uh, Mexico are very clear. Uh, the Vienna Convention on uh, uh, Diplomatic Relations was clearly broken uh, by, um, uh, by Ecuador. Not only that, the, the Ecuador actually broke the, the uh, Treaty of Amity between uh, Mexico and, uh, and Ecuador and the regional international law uh, convention that applies there, which is uh, the 1954 uh, diplomatic asylum uh, uh, convention. And the diplomatic asylum convention is very clear in Article 4 that it is for uh, the country uh, uh, granting asylum uh, to determine whether the person uh, is a political uh, uh, refugee who uh, deserves um, uh, diplomatic asylum. It's not a question that uh, Ecuador calls him a criminal, calls him a common criminal, and uh, that would remove uh, the sovereign right 
uh, of Mexico to grant uh, diplomatic asylum. So granting asylum is actually a humanitarian act uh, that, I mean, uh, Mexico did not have to grant uh, uh, diplomatic asylum to Jorge Glass, but it spent two months investigating uh, all the allegations against Jorge Glass and determined that this was lawfare. Determined uh, that uh, all these trumped up charges against him were like the trumped up charges against uh, Julian Assange uh, in, uh, in Sweden. They were politically motivated. So he certainly had the right uh, to invoke uh, the right to asylum, to invoke uh, the Geneva uh, Refugee Convention of 1951, and the International Court of Justice will decide accordingly. Uh, but I said there is a breakdown in the rule of law domestically and internationally. Uh, I see that more and more uh, in the last few years, and I wonder whether, uh, you know, this is uh, the last uh, effort uh, of the capitalist uh, Western world uh, to hold itself. Um, I would say uh, that international law will evolve uh, further, but uh, the uh, motor for the evolution of international law is no longer not going to be the United States or Europe. It's going to be the global majority. It's going to be the thinkers uh, in Latin America, in Africa, and in Asia that are going to take the lead in establishing uh, international law. And uh, I think it's necessary because uh, we have uh, uh, caught ourselves in our own web and in our own parallel uh, world. Uh, we are not acting on the basis of uh, of facts and evidence, uh, we are uh, still somehow lost in our own ideology and in our desperate effort uh, not to lose uh, our exceptionalism. And we're incapable to realize that we've already lost it. I mean, that is, um, if you want tragic, it, it's worse, uh, you know, one of the great uh, Greek tragedies. I mean, we need a Sophocles or an Euripides, or actually to take it on the comic side, you need an Aristophanes to write what is happening uh, in the world right now. But my concern uh, is not just literature. My concern is uh, that since we live in a nuclear world, since uh, we have 10 countries uh, with nuclear weapons uh, and uh, the United States is saber rattling and is provoking and uh, there can be a miscalculation somewhere. I, uh, I, know, I, I know of nine. Which one is the number 10 that you just added? Uh, well, I mean, you're counting Israel? I count Israel as part of the nine. Counted Israel and counted uh, uh, North Korea, of course. No, I'm not counting the, Tehran yet. The, I mean, yeah. So, I, so I the so the P the P five, right? The uh, P five have it. But also Pakistan has Pakistan, it. India, India has it. North Korea, and Israel. Yeah. Is there a tenth one? I Are you suspecting is Iran? Uh, well, I wouldn't put it past it, uh, but whether it be nine or ten. It is highly dangerous. Okay. Uh, because take uh, the uh, insane idea uh, of, um, you know, putting these um, uh, missiles in uh, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if NATO uh, were to try a preemptive uh, strike on, um, uh, on uh, uh, Russia, and let's remember that the only country that has ever used the atomic weapon is the United States. Uh, uh, Russia has had atomic weapons uh, now for 70 years and has never used them. The United States uh, had them and tried them out in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, certainly one of the mega crimes of the 20th century. Uh, but the United States keeps trying to uh, 
whitewash it and try to explain it away when indeed uh, was uh, a genocide. It was a, a crime against humanity. Uh, so uh, in any event, uh, I don't see Russia uh, doing uh, a preemptive strike on the United States. But the United States and the crazies uh, in NATO are capable of uh, thinking of a preemptive strike on Russia. But even assuming that they were to annihilate St. Petersburg and um, and uh, Moscow and Vladivostok, you realize that the oceans are alive with nuclear submarines uh, that have nuclear warheads. So if uh, the United States were to uh, attack Russia, forget New York, Washington, Los Angeles, San Francisco, they're gone. Uh, and they have hypersonic uh, missiles which we don't yet. And uh, so uh, in a situation like that, uh, the only thing you can do is to de-escalate, de-escalate. Uh, just do not create a situation in which someone can make a mistake uh, or even a computer glitch, because sometimes if this can happen, can be activated uh, by artificial intelligence, and then that's the end of humanity.